Good morning, everybody, as you're coming in. Um, do feel free to use the chat just to let us know where you're joining from and uh, who you are. Uh, there's still a few more people coming into the room. I can see it always takes Zoom a um, few minutes to let everybody in the room. <laughs> Sunny in South London, well, that's a good sign. When you uh, put your messages into the chat, do feel free to pick everyone in the little drop down there so that everyone can see your comments instead of just the host and the, and the panelists. Fantastic, quite a lot of people coming in now, right? I think we're going to kick off. I should just introduce myself. I'm Trisha Duffy. I'm chair of the Albert Directorate and I'm also uh, a longtime strategy advisor to Albert. I've been working with Albert for the best part of seven years now. Um, so very, very privileged to be here, but I actually started my career in sports. I worked as a production assistant in uh, on a programme for ESPN Sports Centre, the international edition, back a long time ago. We talked about decades earlier when we were just uh, meeting each other, more decades than I cared to, re to remember. Um, and so, yeah, it's very much my privilege to be back working with the sports community again after all of those years, um, working my way through as a, as a production assistant, production coordinator and production manager. So, yeah, it feels very um, circular to be having this conversation. Um, it's fantastic that you are here this morning to engage in this topic. Um, there are people from all over the world I can see jo uh, joining us. We've got people from Staffordshire, London, uh, Uganda. Um, obviously, and um, and and from Jordan from the um, from the UAE. So, a very very welcome everybody. Uh, do keep on introducing yourselves in the chat. It's very good if we can keep these things as interactive as possible. And while you're just getting settled, I'm going to ask the Albert team to post in the chat um, links to our social media channels so that you can keep up to date on all Albert's news. You can find us on all the usual platforms with the. Um, handle We Are Albert at We Are Albert. And I also need to take the opportunity to thank. Albert's industry event partners, Sergeant Disc, Good Energy, Location One, Camera, and Green Tomato Cars are the event partners that allow us to put events like this on and make sure that they maintain a free to access um, position so that everyone in the industry can, can come to our events free of charge. Um, I should also just mention that we were hoping that um, Seema Jaswal would be joining us today. Um, you may have seen that in some of the advertising. Unfortunately, she's been unavoidably detained. But um, we are so, so grateful to have Caroline DeMores here instead, who has got so much unbelievable relevant experience that we've just had a gift basically presented and fallen into our laps. So as I said, I'd love to encourage your questions, your comments, introduce yourself in the chat, but please do use the Q&A button for your questions. I will be coming back throughout the morning to try and raise as many of those for you as possible. And thank you to those who sent questions in advance. Um, at, last year, we launched the Sports Consortium, um, which has been the most incredible um, unifying collaboration to bring all of the sports broadcasting and television industry, production industry together to talk about the challenges. Uh, and that consortium is chaired by the wonderful Hazel Irvin. So it's my pleasure now to hand over to her, who's going to chair and moderate today's session. Hazel, over to you. Thank you, Tricia, and hello everyone, at wherever you are. Welcome to our virtual room and to our discussion today. It's absolutely delightful to be with you. It's a shame I can't see all of your faces, but I know you're there, I feel your presence, so you're welcome. Um, now, our seminar today is called Carry the Ball. Can sports broadcasting help slow the climate crisis? So we're doing our running back thing, and we are hoping to carry the ball forward for at least a few more yards on this issue, uh, particularly, I think, on the editorial issues around sports broadcasting and climate change. And you'll see that I have my ball, which I'm hoping to carry a few yards in this regard. Uh, now, my own memories of the glint of gold, silver and bronze are still fresh after a ringside seat at the Olympic Games in Tokyo, albeit a virtual ringside seat, I have to confess, and many of you joining us today will have either been involved in or will have watched many sporting events this summer, from Euro 2020 to Tokyo Olympics in Paris, at Wimbledon, major golf events like the Open and the Solheim Cup, the British Grand Prix, all of the cricket, World Test Championship, T20, Tour de France, Lions Tour, and many, many other events over the last few months. And from a broadcaster and broadcasting perspective, I think that list would always have represented a hugely challenging summer in any year. 
But in a year still dominated by COVID restrictions, it was even more demanding. I think all of us involved would certainly admit that. But the public reaction to these big events underscores, I think, just how badly we all needed them uh, to share a collective experience that made us feel good after a very difficult 18 month period. But for all of the feel good factor that these events engender and continue to engender going forward, it's no longer possible, I think, to hide from the impact of climate change on many sports. It's the impact of weather, it's of heat, of rain, of fire, of flood, and many other issues, plastic, for example, in our oceans. And it's also clear that many commentators and broadcasters and sports stars, very importantly themselves, are using their influence both to inspire and to raise awareness of the fundamental questions around climate change that are affecting us all. Now, as Tricia explained, I uh, came involved in the sports consortium at Albert last year. She twisted my arm, but I didn't take much twisting, I have to say. Um, and it was set up last year to explore and act upon and to reduce and mitigate the impact of sports broadcasting as an industry uh, on the environment. And we've made some real progress in many areas, including sustainable production certification through Albert. Many of you will be very familiar with that. Uh, procurement uh, processes as well. I think what's been really encouraging from a personal perspective and to echo Trisha's uh, comments on this has been the determination, the passion to share knowledge between, let's face it, sometime rivals in this business and the real spirit of collaboration that really genuinely infuses every one of our meetings. But it's, I think, on editorial matters that we feel that we could start to make even more of a difference, and not just around the questions of sustainability of the productions themselves, but on how we talk about these issues on the air. So it's about informing the content of what we do in sport, recognising both the reality of climate change and inspiring the audience through our sports stars and editorial actions to consider making positive changes and choices in our own lives. So in that way, we normalise the discussion about trying to become at net zero by 2050. And we are talking to four brilliant guests about all of that today. We have David Garrido from Sky Sport, David Goldblatt, who's a writer and academic and chair of Football for Future, Caroline de Marais, as uh, Tricia has been talking about, Red Bull Television, and many, mother, many other outlets as well, and Fergus Garber, who is the head of production at BT Sport. And I'm going to ask them all to say hello, to introduce themselves, and to give us some opening thoughts, I think, on their involvement and their interest in this subject, and perhaps an insight into their own sustainability journey from a personal and pers professional perspective. So firstly, I would like to say good morning to my friend and indeed fellow colleague, David Garrido from Sky Sports. And hello and good morning, David. Hi there, Hazel. My goodness, it's been some time. So lovely to be uh, working with you again. And hello to everyone on the chat. I've just seen some, some names from my, uh, from my past at the BBC, some current colleagues from, from Sky and, and elsewhere in the industry. It's, it's great to have such a, uh, a lively community really when it comes to sustainability in sport. So um, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, I'm a, a presenter for Sky Sports, have been for the last 10 and a half years. And I've been very sort of keenly focused on sustainability, I'd say in the last year, visibly in the space. I've been thinking about it for some time and the notion of purpose was something that was sort of nagging away at me for a good two or three years. And I think that actually at the start of COVID, I, or the, the pandemic, March 2020 time, that was all starting to really kind of crystallize for me and really felt that I wanted to, to enter the conversation. I just started looking at the landscape and who I could speak to about it. And then, as I say, in the last year, really motored on with some projects with, with Sky support, which is great because Sky really do represent for this. And I really feel that I've got a lot of people backing me to, to make contact at the nexus of sport and sustainability, which is what I love doing. Um, personally, um, I've been sort of, at it if you like for a few years and um, I uh, try and eat as much of a plant-based diet as I can um, I do really think about how I get about and not trying to use my car I, I don't have an electric car myself uh, but my parents do my sister does and as soon as I can afford one I will get one um, so yeah I, I'm very much involved in that sort of personally and I do feel you do need to walk your own talk if you want to represent in this space um, so I'd say I'm along the journey and I think the great thing about this Hazel is there's always a next step to take you know you're, you're never done you're never the the finished article in sustainability um, and I feel that both professionally and personally I can continue to, to take steps and it's an exciting journey so it's great to be on that journey myself. Thank you David it's lovely for you to share that with us we really appreciate it thanks and uh, from one David to another we welcome David Goldblatt uh, good morning to you David. How are you doing and where do you stand on all of this, please? So um, 
I first read about the, uh, as it was quaintly referred to, the greenhouse effect in 1987 and concluded pretty quickly that this was going to be the most profound political um, uh, issue of my lifetime. And I ended up writing a PhD on the subject in the early 1990s uh, and concluded that until there was gigantic levels of economic damage and threat, no one was really going to do very much about it. And thus was rather stymied through the 90s and early 2000s as to where to hang one's hat. Along the way, I got diverted into being a historian and sociologist of football in particular and sport in general. Um, in 2018, I kind of concluded sort of the circle uh, and came back to this topic because I could see for the first time how profoundly climate change was influencing sport. And I recognized what a potent tool sport could be in the politics of climate change. And so my little lockdown COVID project was to write a document called Playing Against the Clock, the Climate Crisis and Global Sport, um, and to generate a overview of the um, uh, impact of climate change on sport, uh, sport's own contribution to the climate crisis by its production of carbon, um, to think about the governance of global sport and the environment, and above all, to think hard about what we can do, not merely as individuals, but actually the big structural and institutional transformations that are the precondition of reaching carbon uh, zero. Thank you, David. In fact, I know you're gonna share some of those thoughts and indeed musings that you've had very seriously over the last few months with us since uh, the, the greenhouse effect was first mentioned, as you said, all those years ago. I'm also delighted to say, uh, and indeed to echo Trisha's welcome to Caroline de Marais, who's very kindly stepped in uh, recently to be with us today. We're very grateful to you, Caroline. And uh, where are you at? And not literally, but on all of this at the moment, do these issues influence your personal and professional life, Caroline, to what extent? Yeah, so I'm, I've got to be honest, I'm really new to all of this. And I'd, you know, been recycling and doing my little part, but I've always kind of thought, well, I'm little old me, how am I going to really make enough of an impact? And it was only recently when I did a job with Extreme E um, in Greenland, which I, I'm sure you'll ask me about later, so I can go into it more. But that's when I really kind of started to understand um, I, admit, I guess also because I could see it and it's so different when you see it on television to so seeing it in reality and speaking to people and that whole job was just set up in such a brilliant way that we had researchers, professors, people on hand who this is their job, this is their career, their life work and they were just able to put it into really simple layman's terms that no one is too small and you absolutely have to do everything from coming home and one of them saying to me you know I just make sure that my lights are turned off at a certain time and I was mm -hmm. like really and he's like yeah I, I turn my lights off and he was like I will get off the train earlier and I will walk that extra and it's just the tiniest things but put really simply because we I think I certainly used to think of climate change is something that was just really big and that I couldn't make a difference in. And so being on that job and just seeing the smallest kind of differences that that job did, and I'm a sports reporter and host, and so I'm always traveling, I'm on so many jobs, and I saw really little changes that they made that other jobs potentially don't even think about making but it all has such a vast impact. So I think I, I left that and it was only a few weeks ago and it's, it's really changed my kind of mindset just on a day, day to day basis. It's not, I haven't changed anything super drastic, but I, and it sounds really simple, but I now know that those tiny little steps just make an impact. So for me, I'm the newest, I would say to this and probably the most naive, but um yeah, I'm now, I'm now slightly changed and making the smallest little impacts, but I know that they go really far. So yeah, I'm the newest, I would say, on this journey. Well, you're a very, very welcome newbie. And uh, indeed, I know that your, your influence is going to help a lot of people come to it as well because of your passion that you're clearly showing. And we will discuss a little bit more of um, your adventures with Formula E and indeed Extreme E a little bit later on. Thanks, Caroline. 
Uh, and the fourth member of our panel today is Fergus Garber from BT Sport, who's very been very much been a leading light, I think, in our sports consortium. He has, I must say, been one of the more passionate and constructive contributors, and there are many, uh, to the debate there and the, the challenge to us to try and improve um, our contributions in this direction. Um, Fergus, hello again. It's only been a couple of days since we last spoke uh, via Zoom. Can you give us a sense of your role at BT and how you assess the challenges for sports broadcasters in particular around climate change, please? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, well, first of all, I, I don't have a driving license and I don't drive. So that uh, is a little bit of my contribution. I've, I'm also a bit of a dab hand with sort of electrics. So all the halogen lights in my house disappeared a number of years ago to be replaced with LED. So while we're talking about our own personal contribution, I suppose that's mine. Um, from a professional um, perspective, um, one thing that we have in sport, certainly behind the camera, is you know we don't make we don't make single-use plastic. We don't make widgets. Um, so for us to um, make change is. Uh, in the media business and the television business specifically is actually uh, quite a simple matter because it doesn't actually hit our bottom line. <laughs> um, so I, I guess it all started for me with uh, uh, many of you will be um, familiar with the SVG group and they hosted a uh, sustainability session um, at a fantastic ses uh, setting, which was the Laws Media Centre. Uh, where we were told in a three-hour session that the first hour and a half we were going to be made to feel like shit about the uh, about the climate crisis, and then in, in the hour and a half that followed, uh, we were going to be told how we could help to make it better. So that's where it started for me. I came out of that session feeling pretty revved up. Um, I went back to BT Sport. The first thing I did was. I got Jeremy Matthew, who again, some of you are familiar with, who just trained me um, to train my senior management team. They came out of that session feeling exactly the same way as I did. And from that point forward, making changes at BT Sport was quite simply pushing against an open door. So training is um, really, really a really crucial first step um, and from that point forward, we have just um, made what we think has great strides, uh, both in training people and cutting down our carbon footprint. And maybe I can go into a little bit more about how we do that later. We will indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Fergus. Thanks for outlining that and indeed for changing light bulbs. Um, I was <laughs> watching the recent Albert News seminar, uh, which was called Not Just Another News Story just a couple of weeks ago. In fact, I think it was just last week. Um, and Paddy Logan was there from the UNFCCC and he talked about there being no debate about the existence of climate change now. And he said the world's warming. It's us. It's bad, but we can fix it, which I thought was a very interesting and precise summation. But there is perhaps for lots of people, both in sports industry itself and audiences that we that we talk to, a disconnect between climate change and sports specifically. And so we're really clear about the impact of what we're talking about. I'm going to hand over to, to David Goldblatt actually for a short presentation on this subject, just to make sure that we're all on the same page on this subject. So David, take it away, sir, please. Thank you, Hazel. Um... So in terms of the impact of climate crisis on sport, just to remind everybody, the marathon at the Tokyo Olympics was meant to, uh, meant to happen in Tokyo. But of course, it happened 500 kilometers north, 1,000 kilometers north um, in Sapporo because the weather in Tokyo uh, in August makes it physiologically dangerous for athletes to compete. Um, because the average temperature in Tokyo is about two degrees centigrade higher than it was in 1964 when they ran the marathon in October. Um, and in addition to that, you know, two typhoons uh, led to um, changes in the schedule for rowing and um, for the surfing. So it's here already. If we think back to early 2020, the environmental story of the year before COVID uh, was the wildfires in Australia which saw stadiums, both cricket and tennis, fill with smoke and make play essentially impossible. Um, the floods that have just happened in Germany 
um, uh, this summer, which are clearly related to the climate crisis, caused, according to the German uh, Olympic Committee, 100 million euros worth of damage to grassroots sporting facilities. Um, so it's here and it's here with us now, just to give you the basic overview of what we can expect in the next um, 30 years. Um, I would say, first of all, climate change means increasing higher ambient average temperatures. So winter sports almost everywhere in the world are in an enormous amount of trouble. Uh, the re research done in 2010 suggests that by 2050, um, approximately half of previous hosts of the Winter Olympics will be unreliable hosts because there will be insufficient snow. And by 2080, pretty much everybody is going to be an unreliable host. And that's based on data and projections, I think, that are a considerable underestimate as the speed and the scale of the climate crisis grows. Um, of course, when you get higher temperatures, you're also going to get more extreme forms of weather. Um, typhoons and hurricanes are going to be happening more often and their intensity is going to be greater. This impacts upon sport, partly in terms of cancellations. We saw this at the Rugby World Cup in 2019, um, but we've also seen it in terms of terrible damage to sporting facilities, uh, cricket grounds, for example, in the Caribbean, where, you know, Grenada's brand new cricket stadium was turned into matchsticks in 2017. Um, flooding is clearly going to be a gigantic problem for sports facilities all over the world, especially those that are in coastal cities where most of the world is currently living. Um, I did a bit of research on this myself based on um, climate and flooding projections in England, and I would say about one quarter of England's professional football stadiums are going to be facing major annual flooding problems by 2050. Um, you may have seen Fulham's uh, shop, Fulham FC's shop got flooded a couple of weeks ago. I expect that to be happening to football stadiums in England over the next 30 years. Um, it's worth mentioning in all of this, much of the debate is often about the impact on big tournaments and the big events in global sport. That, of course, is incredibly important. But this is going to have a huge impact on grassroots sport all over the world. Um, as the number of days over 40, 45 and 50 degrees centigrade increase, what is going to happen to playing sport outdoors in Ghana, in the Gulf, in the Lebanon, in Nigeria? Um, I think it's going to be virtually impossible um, to play sport outdoors for most of the year in, um, in much of sub-Saharan Africa by the time we get to 2050, unless we make some very, very considerable changes. Drought is also going to be an issue. And again, um, this will be less of a problem in the global north where there are water facilities and there are alternative resources. But in the global south, this is going to be a huge issue and how, the, how we are going to maintain the possibility of outdoor sport um, uh, uh, on grass or turf um, is, um, is very serious. Um, so right across the board, from grassroots sport to the very highest level of professional sport, um, uh, you know, from uh, increasing temperatures to flooding, to drought, um, to the health of athletes, and indeed the health of spectators. Um, uh, in 2014, the Australian Tennis Open um, saw 1,000 members of the audience receiving medical treatment for some kind of heat-related stroke or illness. Uh, and according to the Australian Climate Council, those kinds of days in Australia's sporting season are going to be many, many more times more frequent over the next 20 or 30 years. Um, and just as a sort of final parting shot on this, um, this is going to have a really huge, some, some event is, you know, that's going to force everyone to really take up um this issue is going to occur i was enjoying like everybody else um the uh, euros um this uh, this summer and enjoying the very benign english summer that we had in june and july um but it occurred to me on um uh, in early uh, uh july when england were in the quarterfinals that in five years we'll be doing the same enjoying the uh, men's world cup in 2026 being played in canada the United States and Mexico. And on that day, on that day that England were playing in the quarterfinals, we're looking at a quarterfinal in Seattle 
in 2026. And on that day, it was 43 degrees centigrade in Seattle and 42 degrees centigrade in Edmonton, where they're planning to play some of the group games as well. And it is not possible to play at 43 degrees centigrade. So that's, that's if it's not the 2026 World Cup, something is coming down the line like that. Wow. Thank you very much indeed, David. Um, it reminds me of what Fergus said earlier on about his first um, training stint where this is concerned. Scare the living daylights out of us to start and then let's see what we can do to get through this and indeed to make some of these issues that you have so eloquently raised uh, part and parcel of our everyday usage within sports broadcasting. And I guess I should try and get a sense of, of the reaction to that from our four panellists today. I'm sure those of you who are watching elsewhere will certainly tell us on the chat uh, your reaction to what David's just been saying. Uh, David Greedy, if I can come to you, first of all, we clearly have a responsibility when covering these sports, not least Olympic Winter Games, just to pick one of the many that David's been talking about. W what would you say are, are the challenges of raising these issues and have we been doing enough so far in order to try and do so? So yeah, absolutely is a responsibility, no doubt about that. Um, I think when you compare with what David said and, and I was aware of some of those issues and I think people who've been working in this space for a while have, have heard some of these case, sort of cases and, and stories before but but there's always unfortunately new ones and and David's brought us bang up to date with 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 all of these latest happenings and and it is really quite stark and it just shows the urgency of this and it is really happening now and so the responsibility is even more acutely felt I would say um and I think that what I felt especially during the the pandemic and especially during um, after, after George Floyd's murder and Black Lives Matter is that broadcasters can take a stance and broadcasters can take that responsibility. Um, and we've been doing it at Sky with Black Lives Matter and keeping it on the agenda. And, and, and it makes me think, well, why then can't we do that with, with climate change? And, you know, I, I feel that we very much should be taking the lead because we have this incredible, you know, scale of people that we can talk to this huge audience all of us as broadcasters no matter who you work for um is enough being done well no no there isn't and i think that you know it's not just about how much it's done it's how you do it um clearly we can we can create campaigns we can put content out there we can talk to our audience but also i think it's the way in which we talk to our audience and it's something that i'm very very conscious of is you know we if you want try and wag your finger at them, try and tell them the planet's burning and it's, the, it's everyone's fault. I'm not sure it's necessarily going to engender the best response. And I think that actually that's a, a key point to this is trying to be as encouraging. And I know that we'll, we'll come on to this, as you said, Hazel, later on um, ab about what good work is being done and how that should inspire other people in sport, other sporting entities to get on the journey and do it themselves. But also all of us, all of us who, who value what these sports entities represent, whether you support that team or you admire or revere or even idolize that athlete and they stand for something, you know, look at Lewis Hamilton, look at Patrick Bamford. Um, and then it might make you think, okay, well, I care about what that person stands for. I'm going to show those values in my life as well. But the way in which we talk to people to try and encourage them to do that is, is also key, but, but ultimately it's a responsibility. Yes. Does more need to be done? Absolutely. Indeed. And as you say, we'll go on to, to some examples of good practice very shortly, David, in that regard. Um, from, from Caroline, you mentioned earlier too, as you were very honest about this, and the fact that you've, you're, you're reasonably new to the thought processes about what you're going to do and indeed what the industry can do. Uh, from what we heard from David earlier on, is that shocking to you? Um, how, what was your reaction to, to some of the, the issues that you raised earlier there? Well, yeah, I am new. And I think... Um... As you say, and as David mentioned, it's being considered by broadcasters. In some cases, yes, um, I especially, you know, working on Extreme E, but I think that was a, a rare case. I think there's more that broadcast can, broadcasters can do, but I do think it's also quite difficult as a presenter responding to live sports action, but also be ready to offer a climate change context. So, Working in on Extreme E recently, 
its very nature as a sport is dedicated to highlighting climate change. So that made the whole environment a lot easier. Talking about climate change wasn't seen as maybe political or a bit strange. It didn't unnerve producers or it didn't unnerve people. And you knew that the people watching at home, you know, they've signed up for that. So when you know that your audience is receptive to this conversation and to those messages, it I didn't feel, I guess, in danger of going over the top or discussing the environment because the whole setup, I felt very padded. I felt very cushioned and supported in every kind of sense. I mean, from even from mealtimes, we bought our own plates and cutlery and we would, everyone, there was nothing disposable. So we ate with our own plates and cutlery. I mean, if you forgot your plate, you had to kind of wait for someone else and borrow theirs. But then at the end, you were kind of washing your, your, your dishes. I've never, ever been on a gig where I provide my own cutlery and plate and then I wash it up afterwards. But that's such a simple little, little thing that we might not even think about. Um, but, you know, I've worked on the Dakar. I'm here on a motorsport job. It's, it's just natural that it's disposable plates. And I don't think that's not a criticism. It's just, I think, switching our brains to going, it's okay. You can totally do that. And it becomes the norm, a bit like water bottles, right? It's become the norm now that people carry their own water bottles. Um, so I think there is more that we can do. And that's just off camera. On camera, of course, I think there's more we can do. But it's just finding that happy balance. Because as a, as a sports reporter, my job is to report on the sport. And so I have to find a nice way of bringing in what's happening. And there are ways. It's just suddenly having that switch on your brain going oh okay yeah this is completely linked the marathon the temperatures is completely linked and we can just bring that in but I think we're just habitually used to maybe not and concentrating just on the sport and leaving climate as a separate topic and it's just finding the link I think that's a very, very well-made point actually because as you say we are in the business and indeed ultimately the entertainment business um, of sports broadcasting so you, you're obviously not going to mention this at match point or indeed as a, as a ball is being swung across from a corner kick <laughs> um, but but I think you also raise a very good point there Caroline with regard to editorial support and having that editorial backing of the whole team behind you because ultimately as an individual broadcaster you have to have a lot of experience and nuanced experience to know when it is appropriate to introduce these these uh, these matters. And, and Fergus, this is something that we've covered a lot in the consortium. Uh, in terms of BT Sports, and indeed from what you've seen and heard from other broadcasters, is it the editorial, the overarching editorial considerations that we should be addressing here as a team, as a broadcasting team, and not just putting the onus on the individual broadcasters here? Um, yeah, I, th I think... Um, we, we've come to a point where we should be fairly un, unapologetic about what we talk about. We do have, um, we do have um, some high profile topics, not just sustainability as, as, as David mentioned. You know, hate speech um, and Black Lives Matter are two things that have been huge, particularly, you know, with the conclusion of the Euros, BT, uh, BT and BT Sport were very big on running a hate speech campaign all the way through the Euros. Um, now it's time to turn our attention to um, to sustainability because you know it's getting worse. As, as David Goldblatt said, it's, it's getting worse. It's not going away, um, and it will affect sport more and more. You, 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 the point I was making about um, being unapologetic is just going to increase with every month that goes by and particularly with COP26 uh, coming sharply into focus now it's a I, I don't think there's ever been a better time um, for sports broadcasters to start talking about it um, and I think you know we often use uh, use expressions like you know uh, uh, inactivity in itself is 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 a crime, um, and I think that's particularly relevant um, with 
uh, the crisis we all face and what we can do as sports broadcasters to uh, to tap possibly an untapped market. Everybody else is talking about it. But why shouldn't we as well? Uh, Caroline, you know, you, you're in a good position because um, the work that you do is, um, is all about um, sustainability in sport. Um, and David Greedo makes the point that it, it's... It's it it can be quite tricky to to weave it in here and there, but I think, as I say, with every day that goes by, it's becoming easier and easier to do that. In fact, actually, we will respond now about the solutions and the opportunities because that's led us on to this now, guys. And um, I think it would be interesting and instructive in that regard uh, to show some examples of, of good practice over the last few months uh, and what we can share between us. And we have a few examples that we've collated from some of the events over the summer of, of good practice, and in my case, reasonable practice. Well, there you go. There, there are some examples that we've collated, and thanks to everybody for, for, uh, for doing that and for sharing. Uh, but as you've seen, it's, it's not just about randomly inserting climate mentions. It's got to be authentic. It's got to be relevant, and it's got to land with audiences. Uh, and you saw there Wimbledon's Environment Day, Sky Sports is your sustainability show reel there, David, Formula E, the Olympics, uh, and one or two other things I'm sure that we could have inserted, but we don't want to spend all of our time just uh, reviewing that. So a lot of work is very positively being done here. Um, and which, I guess it, it is, it's better and easier when you have events such, Car such as Caroline's um, Extreme E, uh, Extreme Formula E, um, which is sustainable by its very nature. And it's certainly easier to showcase sports who are, by the very definition, uh, related to this, this question. But David, we're about to see a net zero football match on Sky. Um, how did that come about? And does it make your job an awful lot easier when you have a theme to grasp onto? And does it help when the sports themselves are manufacturing uh, opportunities for you to talk more readily about this? Sure, yeah, it, it absolutely does. I think that um, Caroline mentioned this point before, that, you know, you've got something like Extreme, which is very much set up to, to bring home that message. In fact, I would say arguably it's sustainability message first, sporting spectacle second, um, but it's still a compelling sporting spectacle. You know, some of the 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 wheel to wheel combat, some of the crashes and rolls we've seen already, you know, it's it's really exciting. It's great. It's great to watch. It's great that you're involved with it, Caroline. And, and obviously, a number of broadcasters have the, have the rights here in the UK um, with Extreme E. So they're they're clearly making a big effort to get it out there. And yeah, as you say, Hazel, we've got the the net zero carbon football match coming on called Game Zero. Um, it's Spurs against Chelsea at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Uh, this coming Sunday, 19th September. Uh, we're putting an awful lot into it. Um, I'll be broadcasting from there. Uh, Sky Sports News will be live from there from, from 10 o'clock. And then, of course, Super Sunday uh, itself with, with the game. And this has been in, in the works for a while. Over the last few months, we've done a few things. Sky Sports Summer of Sustainability, uh, we actually uh, launched that in mid-July and we did a, a climate action takeover day on Sky Sports News. I uh, was sort of whizzing around the country in an electric car, visiting sport, stories of sport and sustainability, coming together and great examples of climate action and also examples, admittedly, as well, of climate change. And it's, it's important to have both sides of that story. And so that was involving Sky Sports News. Um, golf did an awful amount as well. Lots of features around the Open um, at, uh, at Royal St George's in, in Kent, in Sandwich, and also in Formula One, where we had um, the British Grand Prix live on Sky 2 and, and features involving Nico Rosberg, who's, of course, a huge environmentalist uh, himself. And so then we thought, well, what's the next stage of that? And I think, you know, football is followed by 3.5 billion people. So it's got a huge opportunity. That, well, what better fixture to pick? A London derby. Spurs have started the season well. Chelsea are European champions. They've started the season well as well. Game at, at, at uh, the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium and, and Spurs as well are an incredible partner to work with because they do so much in sustainability. Uh, I've seen Claire, Claire Poole from Sport Positive Summit is, is uh, on this call and, um, Claire and, and Sport Positive uh, did some fantastic work in essentially ranking the Premier League clubs in terms of sustainability and Spurs finished top. So great way to sort of get this match staged. And I think actually what it is, it's, it's proof of concept. It's showing everyone that this is possible. This is the way that football could be, should be, and maybe needs to be in the future. But I, I like the, the could be bit because it shows not just possibility, but opportunity. And it also 
allows us to talk to all of the fans who are watching that game live on Sky Sports on Super Sunday and getting them just to think about it. Like, like Caroline was saying, that little bit of a mindset switch, just opening your mind to the idea of, oh, maybe I could do this. Maybe I could try that plant-based meal. Maybe I, I will get off the, the train to stop earlier or I'll think about using my bike to get to you know, my next meeting or to a game. Um, and so we'll be reflecting all of those elements. And it's really with that in mind to, to show that it can be done and hopefully it will be done more in future. And also for the fans, you know, that's, that's I think the, the real power of this, Hazel, is sport has such unique relationship with its audience. People idolize, people love, people revere, people respect the practitioners of sport, be it clubs or, or athletes. And therefore, we can really harness that passion point. And we speak to people at such huge scale, you know, 3.5 billion people follow football. So we'll be hoping to do our bit and really getting the audience really introduced to this um, much more strongly. And I, I really agree with, with um, uh, you know, what Fergus was saying about not being apologetic about it. I don't see why we have to be. You know, yes, we want to try and sew it in in the right ways. And, you know, lovely examples from yourself as well, Hazel, talking about the medals, talking about the, the, the Olympic flame. But I don't think that we should go, oh, sorry to mention this. Oh, it's going to be a bit awkward. No, we, we have the responsibility to do it. And we have to find reasons to do it. And I think if we, we put on something like this with Spurs, with Chelsea, with the support of the Premier League, um, then I think, you know, we, we're making a really compelling argument to our audience. And you're very far down the line with this, David, because I can I can hear and I think we all can see your passion for this and, and your commitment to it as well. Uh, Fergus, you, you've said that BT Sport are sort of embarking on your journey here. How are you trying to enshrine this in editorial policy and, of course, to empower your presenters and pundits in this regard? Is there much more as an industry that we could be doing? Are we missing a trick? And how do we find out? Um, OK, so... Uh, we are about to uh, embark on our editorial journey. Um, it's We're going to start on Saturday. We've teamed up with a global uh, platform, CounterSim, where, uh, as our call to action, where um, our audience can, it's somewhere where our audience can go to take a step, or be it eat a meat free meal or um, travel greener. There's lots of options that they can do. Um, and it's the start next week is the climate Co coalition's great big green week with um, events up and down the country so that's where we're going to start talking to our audience um, we see it as um, a combination of two messages actually and we've, we talked about this uh, about you know scaring the bejesus out of people um, and then let them know what they can do so it's it is um, a careful uh, marriage of those two um, those two steps um, in order to we hope um, to uh, provide um, the best results um, you know sports fans a lot of them are in themselves very vocal about just wanting to watch you know, football or whatever sport they're into and nothing else. Um, BT get a lot of complaints when uh, we go off topic, um, but, you know, we don't care. And um, it's going to be like that with um, with sustainability messaging. Uh, what else did you ask me, Hazel? I've completely forgotten. Don't you worry. Actually, I think you actually put me in mind of a new point, um, and that is a very serious point about the need to balance the twin requirements of underscoring the threat of, of climate change and how we yeah. mitigate it. You don't want to be doomsaying the entire time because, as you very rightly that, point out, it's an entertainment right. business, clearly. Uh, well, and, I, and actually, I, I would be very interested in your, inter in your uh, opinions on this, Fergus. Obviously, those are David Goldblatt, too, because... Uh, You've outlined the horrors of it, David, <laughs> but what do we, in your opinion, do about it? Fergus, if you want to answer that one first, and then I, I shall, uh, I, I'll, I'll chuck that one and you do it a bit later. Yeah, I, th I think David mentioned um, Claire Paul, who I know is on the call. I think it was her. I'll give her credit for this one anyway. Um, I think she said, um, be a hypocrite, not a cynic. Um, and I've used that a lot um, when um, sort of talking to talking to um, uh, BT Sport people and the bosses who are worried about, you know, what happens when one of our pundits turns up in a 
gas guzzling enormous car at a football match um and how we're going to deal with you know some pr fallout in that respect um you know it's important to it's important to recognize your achievements um and you know and also own up to the fact that you've got lots more to do and this is all tied up with with how you manage editorial and you know that that fear that you're going to get caught out so you have to be able to you have to be able to point to something positive that you have done and but you on the other side of the coin you also have to say and we completely acknowledge we've got lots more to do and the other and what's particularly important i don't know how the other guys feel about this is when you're talking to a sports audience it's really really important not to preach um and finding a way to um to do that is is really the silver bullet really um making making your audience feel really really you know comfortable and encouraged but not spoken uh you know, not told what to do. That's really important. I think that's a very good point. And actually, I, sh I will indeed throw it to David Goldblatt. The silver bullet, how do we find it? What is it in this regard? There are no, there's not one silver bullet. You have to have a more complex armory to deal with such a complex question. But what I think sport is really offering us a kind of range of things is that it's a place where in modern life where people really believe in the power of collective action that you really can be more than the sum of your parts and that they understand that individual action and individual effort actually only delivers its best efforts in the correct context where it is supported and nurtured in various i mean that's the reality of elite sport and it seems to me that's exactly the kind of uh, analogy we require to think about dealing with the climate crisis. We can be more than the sum of our parts by all making our own individual contributions, but at the same time, sport actually teaches us that we need to transform the structures within which we operate if we want to be actually make the best of our individual efforts and endeavours. I mean, a point raised earlier by uh, the the, uh, the other David about encourage people getting to people think, yeah, maybe I'll take the bike rather than the car to the stadium. But of course, you know, until we've got bike parking of a really high caliber at all our sporting facilities, then that's a much more difficult choice. So if we want to make it easy for people to make good decisions, we need bigger level institutional and infrastructural change. But it's the same with sport. You know, you want to get better as a football club, build a better training ground, you know, have better coaches, improve your gym. Of course, that makes it easier for all that individual effort to be transformed into something, you know, something better. Um, I think football, football in particular for me, but I think sport in general is a place where we actually do believe in the possibility of last minute turnarounds. I mean, there is a deep and psychological emotional issue that we're all facing with the climate crisis and we phrased it in different ways, but it comes down to the, wow, this is really big and things are looking like it's in extra time and what are we going to do about it? And sport seems to me a place where we, despite the profound cynicism of modern societies, actually we believe in hope. Actually we believe in the possibility you really can do it. When the time comes and you raise your game, this is, these are powerful metaphors that actually really sit inside our popular culture. So sport has this amazing opportunity. Um, but as you say, both at an individual level and encouraging and in the way we speak to individuals, but it's got to be institutional as well. This is going to need to be led by the football association, by the individual football clubs, by the people with the money and the power in the, in the sports industry. Um, and there, you know, that's another side of the, co of the conversation and something that broadcasters, I think, um, in a quieter voice, need to be leading um, the audience along. I mean, obviously, you're not going to be making that your first port of call. And obviously, it is there's more bang for your buck initially to encourage and nurture um, the audience to transform their understanding and their lifestyle. But I think slightly further down the line, 
we have some bigger questions to address about the institutions themselves. I mean, for example, um, you know, how much longer can we accept fossil fuel um, sponsorship in a sport while simultaneously being 100% committed to dealing with the climate crisis? Not an easy question, uh, um, uh, a complicated question, one that sport of course had to address in relation to tobacco in the past. Um, but I think it's really important that we are beginning that conversation. Hazel, would you would you mind if I just stepped in just on David's point, just to kind of to, to back up what David's saying? But it, and, and I, I'm not going to answer that that fossil fuel question either. <laughs> but just to, just to, to to kind of bring it, these things aren't siloed. We're, we're all sort of working together on this. And 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 David's right in that broadcasters sort of take a lead to highlight these things. People often talk about sort of governments, business and people as the ones who will sort of ultimately affect change. As, as an example, uh, for, for Game Zero at the weekend, Sky have been talking to the coach company involved in actually transporting both squads and, and playing staff to the ground, both Chelsea and Spurs. Now, obviously, if you're the home team, normally the, the, the players travel individually to their own home game. But this time, Spurs are going to their training ground and then getting a coach. And Chelsea are getting a coach from presumably Cobham from, from their training ground. And we've had a conversation with the coach company and convinced them to find a way to make these coaches run on biofuel. And we've actually had this conversation and they thanked us for giving us giving them that challenge because that then is something they can take into other operations. So actually, you know, us as broadcasters highlighting, leading, trying to make this game net zero carbon actually then is part of these these conversations we're having there's 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 other things that are at play here um where actually these 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 worlds do link up yes absolutely there's a huge responsibility on, on people like fifa ua for the fa etc and, and on us as broadcasters and and on people to do what they can but you know we are trying to inform business to say hey this is the sorts of things that you can do that don't just apply in this scenario but that could apply more widely. So that's how I think it's, it's all linked up. And it's, it's quite a complex picture, but it's nice to think that you can have that real impact, not just putting on a game saying, we're net zero carbon for this game. This is game zero. That's the campaign. And then we're done. No, 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 no. You've got to keep that rippling on. You do. Uh, and rippling through are some of the questions um, and comments that have been made on the chat. And indeed, there are some questions. Uh, Tricia, I'm sure you are collating any of those. Uh, what are the messages that are coming through loud and clear from what you're seeing? So actually, I would really, uh, there's a couple of questions. So actually, somebody has asked actually in advance of today and um, on the on the Q&A just now, thank you very much, um, Barry, for, for your question, which I, uh, David, you might just want to make a further comment on, which is asking that question that you've just raised around how brand sponsorship um, affects this and, you know, not just broadcasters, but also federations, teams, athletes, um, and how do we sort of encourage everyone to make those good choices in terms of, um, you know, why, how brands are aligned to the, the sports that they choose to sponsor you know um, money can drive action and he would just love to know your thoughts on that thank you Barry for that question David would you like to, to have a go at that one David is that oh, sorry two, David two, Goldblatt I should yes. be <laughs> and you're both David G as well which means Apologize. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it's a big you know this is a big question I mean and there are real possibilities. I mean, you know, once again, um, brands have a kind of a reach and a power uh, in popular culture that is pretty unparalleled. So it's really, really important if we can find a way to work with people who are authentic and really make a change. I think there's a lot of challenges. On the one hand, there are some absolutely great companies out there doing um, really good things. I mean, I would say, you know, Sky in particular is kind of, an exemplar, uh, it seems to me, in this field and broadcasters in general. But there's um, there's there's some real challenges here. I mean, in particular, I'm thinking about the sportswear industry, um, you know, which is a huge part of the sports industry. Ultimately, in many ways, slightly parasitic, actually, on uh, on the professional sports industry. Without which, you know, which is what's driving uh, its sales. Um, and um, there are many claims uh, being made by the sportswear industry about new technologies, using less water, recycled stuff. And yet I don't see any um, proper carbon footprints and carbon audits 
um, amongst the uh, the big um, the big sportswear brands. So we we have a challenge in the sports industry to keep working with these folks and mobilizing their cultural power and their messaging, but we also need to be pressuring them for change. I mean, I thought the example of the uh, the bus was great um and a really good in micro example of what we can be doing um you know but we need to scale that up and that's where it gets really difficult and really challenging when you're dealing with nike and adidas and puma uh and the like but that's where the real gains also are to be made indeed and actually it's something that sports consortium has been working on from a production standpoint is that the suppliers of our facilities in sports broadcasting, there are a lot of clauses, there's a lot of pressure being put on in, a, in order to help broadcasters themselves move on in this journey. Fergus, you, you spent half your life enmeshed in sports rights negotiation, enmeshed being the, probably the right word in these circumstances, but, but how can broadcasters influence uh, or indeed should they influence the sponsorship deals that David Goldblatt is talking about, um, which are tied up by the individual sports, if the sponsors and indeed suppliers are not uh, themselves convinced about the merits of, of sustainable practices therein? Well, yeah, I, th I think sports bro bro broadcasters um, should try and influence. They should ask the question, I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You know, they get said no to. Um, so there's there's nothing stopping any any um, broadcaster, you know, asking those questions. Um, collaboration is a, is a really important point here with uh, with other other broadcasters. Um, believe it or not, um, certainly around sustainability, um, BT Sport and Sky Sports do not like fight like cats and dogs. Um, we are very collaborative around um, sustainability. Um, and this, you know, the, this doesn't just end with, um, you know, how to produce, you know, how to how to make uh, improvements in remote production technologies and all that kind of thing. It's also, um, you know, how we talk to suppliers. It's also how we talk to rights holders. So um, we have shared a number of common um, clauses. Um, uh, one of which is um, asking rights holders um, about their relationships with sponsors and our expectations of what we expect. Um, and we have come up with a number of clauses and um, it, it does take a collaborative approach with the rights holder. So it is very much a, you know, shall we agree on these clauses and shall we work together to uh, make the whole em enterprise, which is the relationship between licensee and licensor, um, more sustainable um, for the next three years, which is a fairly typical right cycle. Um, so um, I think any broadcaster can do that and any broadcaster should ask the question. And I think that the, the the key to success in this in this area is is not to try and strong arm the broadcaster uh, sorry the license the licensee into something that they're never going to go for. It is to say to them, um, this is our ambition. Um, what's yours? Should we work on it? Should we set out something jointly and work on it together? It's never it's never that straightforward because. Um, uh, licensors have lots of licensees that they have to look after, but it's got to start somewhere. Um, so, uh, and I think now is the time. So, yes, is the answer to the question. Everybody should have a go at their licensors. Well played. Thank you very much, Fergus. Um, Caroline, I'm aware I haven't spoken to you for a couple of minutes. I do apologise. Uh, there are a couple of other points I'd like to make from your experience. Um, one is about the influence and harnessing the influencers, in other words, the sports stars who are genuinely committed uh, to this subject and indeed enhancing uh, sustainability through their own actions. We just saw Hannah Mills actually in that clip from the BBC Olympics, who's now, of course, um, the Olympics most decorated female sailor. And almost literally the second question that she was asked, she was into one about plastic pollution. Now, that's clearly a very powerful voice on that particular subject. And um, from your point of view, Caroline, is enough being done 
to showcase these views and can we, uh, can we get our act together a bit better in that respect? I think we absolutely can because broadcasters, we have more power than we think. And going back to what I said at the beginning where I kind of had a mentality of, well, I'm just little old me, so how can I make a difference? Because I'm not in charge of the channels that I work for. But actually, it, it's so much easier when it is something like Extreme, where we've got professionals and researchers that I could go and ask all of my dumb questions off camera and they could give me all of the answers. But I don't have that when I work on football. And football, you have to have a different cap on. It is different viewers. I'm not saying that all, I'm a football fan, so I'm not saying that all football fans aren't interested in the climate. That's not exactly what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is they're not necessarily prepped and ready to hear and understand climate chat. So it needs to be done in a way that feels authentic and natural. And an example was in lockdown, I had to speak to Hector Bellerin and I spoke to the producer beforehand and we had, a, he had a vision on how he wanted it to go. So my questions were all completely football orientated. And Hector mentioned the Amazon because he's passionate about a tree planting project that he's got in the Amazon and I'm Brazilian. So naturally I went, oh, I'm Brazilian. So what are you doing? And we did go down a different tangent. Luckily that producer, we've worked together a lot. So I know that even though his vision was one thing, I know that what we were talking about was extremely interesting. So he talked about his tree planting project. He then went on to talk about how fast fashion is something that he's highly against. He's designed for Louis Vuitton. He designed the suits for their FA Cup final. He, as a child, used to come home from playing football and touch fabrics because his mother and grandmother worked as factory, in, factory makers in a sewing, um, sorry, they were sewers in a factory for clothes. And so he's so used to touching fabric and knowing what's authentic, what's good quality, what's not. And so that to me, and to any viewer, not just, you know, at the time he was at Arsenal, but to any viewer, it's like, wow, Hector Bellerin knows what real silk is. Hector Bellerin is interested in the fast fashion industry. And so we went down a different tangent than what we were planning on. And I guess I had the experience with that producer where I knew that that would be okay. But I think, most producers and most TV channels just need to, I guess, open your mind. And if you're a new reporter or a new, you're in, this is your new gig and you want to impress, you kind of feel like I want to stick to what my producer's saying because this is my role. But it's about making that mind switch and going, this is super interesting. We don't need to just talk to footballers about football. We can talk to them about what they're passionate about. And same with clubs, our clubs, carbon neutral what's their policy on single-use plastic in their stadiums do they have a zero waste to landfill policy if there are players and coaches or backroom staff who are particularly passionate about the environment why don't we do features around that it gives us a different level of access it gives us a different insight into that club into that player into that backroom staff member and it's important that I guess as broadcasters and producers and reporters, we champion those clubs and those athletes who are making the effort to be more sustainable and others will respond and they'll follow because at the end of the day, I don't think anyone wants to be left behind and no one in particular wants to be seen as an old dinosaur who's stuck in their ways. People want to be cutting edge, especially with football it's you know they've got they they do things like trendy hair and everyone's suddenly following so if you've got a footballer talking about these things it suddenly changes the conversation you know he said he was made fun of when he would turn up to training and that the other teammates would make fun of him and now they're all sending him pictures in dressing room going Hector what do you think about this and he asks about the designers and he asks how sustainable they are where is this from don't go to this shop go here so, um, I think if we if I didn't have the freedom to go down that rabbit hole I would have just asked him not boring questions but I would have asked him questions around football that any anyone else would have so it's important for us to just change the mindset and Caroline I, I think, think that your the... questions would never be boring by the way David sorry to, to come in no, Actually, just, just before you, you you pick up on this can I can I just 
ask you to, to comment on what Caroline's saying. In a way, Caroline has, has actually nailed this because it's about the empowerment of a presenter. Yeah. It's, it's empowering editorially your presenter to be able to talk about this and to be free to talk about it and to be supported in talking about this. You don't want to be in a soapbox accused of hypocrisy and someone kicking it over. That's always in the back of your mind as a, <laughs> as a reporter, presenter and commentator. How, where do you stand on this, Ben? Yeah, look, let me let me back up what Car Caroline has said. I think, you know, we, we're all speaking uh, very much on the same lines here. And there's a lot of kind of goodwill, you know, amongst everyone here um, in, in this session. I think that, you know, athletes for me are key, not only because they're a huge audience, but because, as I mentioned before, of how we look at them. Um, and I think that people are really interested in their lives beyond whatever their field of play is. And I think that some of them are making real efforts. And we've done this, this um, vodcast series recently um, to build up to game zero, which I've been doing called playing for the planet. And my first guest on that is Patrick Bamford, who, who devised this. I don't know if you can see that. So if you're just listening in the kitchen, but basically that is um, bolt for planet. That is his celebration. So, you know, Jesse Lingard's got that and Deli Ali's got that. And, you know, Antoine Griezmann's got that, but Patrick Bamford has put it into popular culture with a celebration. And when he scored a hat-trick against uh, Ch uh, was it Villa last season, he did this to the camera and people were wondering what it is. And that's a kind of cool way to get into it. And just to say, oh, right, OK, so that's what it was. And, 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 and that's really interesting. And, and now people are taking an interest. And, and the reaction to me ta talking to Pat at length about this, you know, it was a good sort of like hour-long chat. So, oh, I didn't realise he was into that. Oh, right, OK. And, and, and you know, he, 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 you know, he wants to get, you know, ground source heat pumps in his house and, and, and look at, you know, various different ways of being sustainable. So I think that, you know, there is a real fascination with what other, what other things they're into. And we can, you know, use the ones that are really pushing for climate action to, to reflect those points. Um, you're, you're right, you, you don't want to be on a soapbox. You don't want to be preaching. We've, we've discussed this before. But I think that actually you can just be honest with the audience and be honest about yourself and sort of say, well, I'm, I'm not perfect and none of us is perfect. And, and Pat himself tried to be plant-based and it didn't quite work out, had to scale it back a little bit. And I think that's another way through is just to, you know, show the warts and all, if you like, or just show the, the, the real true picture. This isn't Insta reality, this is real reality. And just talk about it in that very, very human sense. Because again, it goes back to how we communicate. And I think if we communicate in a genuine way, and we're just having this chat because it's important, and we're going to have this chat and, you know, maybe if you're a little uncomfortable with that, well, just try and allow yourself to get into it. And I think that that, that genuine authenticity is, is a key to kind of getting off the soapbox. Don't even think of a soapbox. Think about just talking about this as you would with your mates and the normal kind of conversations that you have. And, and you know, luckily I've been able to do that with, with sports people. And I think that, as Caroline says, more will come. I'm pretty sure that, you know, this is the, the ripple effect and more and more people starting on this journey. We've got to tell their stories. That's that's what I want to do. And I think that it's really powerful when we have their platforms and our flat platforms combined. Perfect, David. Again, well said. I'm, I'm going to try and wrap this up, uh, guys. And I'd ask you for, for one finishing comment. From what we've said, just making a couple of notes as we've been going along, I think some of the, of the main um, tools that we have going forward is to, is to normalize, to make editorially normal um, the discussions about climate and sustainability uh, and to empower presenters, commentators and reporters to be able to talk about this and to raise these issues on air naturally and indeed not just in a natural way, but in a pre-planned way as well. Um, I should remind everybody that um, Albert training for presenters, commentators, reporters is free uh, for freelancers and indeed staff members. Um, but I should also talk about the other, the other thing that's come out of this for me is planning ahead. It's planning ahead both by broadcasters and indeed by sports, asking sports federations and clubs themselves to include climate um, conversation and sustainability in their own plans for what they're doing. Um, and that effectively creates oven ready, if you'll pardon the expression, editorial content for everybody going forward. And I think another key point that we've been discussing today is about pressuring suppliers as broadcasters uh, with regards to sponsorship and rights holders. And as Fergus so eloquently put it, just asking the question just asking uh, and and if we keep asking perhaps we will get answers that change things so um to sum it up can i have one point from everybody um how positive do you feel about sports broadcasting 
and how it can positively impact the climate conversation and help slow the crisis. Um, David, I think I'll come to you. From everything you've heard, and you've clearly discussed this uh, with many people over the last few years, summing it all up, how positive do you feel about the possibilities? Uh, which, which, David? Oh, I keep doing that. <laughs> Sorry. I'll go, I'll go to David Goldblatt first, please, if I may. Thank you, Hazel. Um, I feel extremely positive. I mean, I think the response of BT Sport actually and BB Sport, BBC Sport with their 2050 uh, website effort earlier this year and Sky, I think it's really fantastic. I have enormous, um, I'm feeling very positive about it. Um, if I could just say one thing, I just encourage everyone, you know, we all have to be brave. There are lots of trolls and deniers and shut mm -hmm. up and play um basically old white men in the sports audience and you can't you know they're part of the conversation but they're not everyone the sports audience and the sports world actually is changing it's diverse and we need to be bold like we have been with black lives matter and be on the right side of history here nicely said caroline how would you sum it up happy positive about what we can do I definitely say I'm more positive and I definitely say that um, especially after being on Extreme E, I have tried to really switch my brain to be more open and to take a little bit of that power that you were saying, because sometimes as a presenter and a reporter, you feel like you do have a role to play. And actually, David, you mentioned the floods earlier and that made me think of the Grand Prix. I mean, Spa didn't go ahead for the first time in its history and the whole time in my mind, I was going, what does that mean for the championship? What does that mean for the riders? And what does that mean for the drivers? And what does that mean for this and that? And we're talking technology. Um, but suddenly I thought, well, it's climate change. And I, I kind of have that in my head here. Now I'm working on a motorsport event. We're in the South of France, but we had a storm yesterday. So already the feature that I'm doing today, I'm gonna mention it because we, we're in the South of France. We expect sunshine, we expect heat but that's not always what we're going to get and so why are we not always going to get that how does that affect the athletes we can ease change and the sporting story together they are a marriage how do the athletes prepare for something when actually the climate might not be what it's supposed to be where it will change the same with the marathon so i think i do feel a little bit more empowered to have that conversation and to talk about it with the producers and the people who are editorially responsible and asking them more for you know a little bit more uh, leeway in talking about it. And I think most people are receptive. I don't think that people are quick to shut it off. It's just asking those questions and being bold enough. We're pushing on an open door, an open door, Caroline. Thank you very much. Fergus, can I have your finishing thoughts, please? Um, well, something just struck me uh, as, you know, I've been talking, uh, listening to Caroline and, and David Garrido talking, uh, was looking at it from a, an audience perspective. And it just struck me that um, as we were talking about normalising it, wouldn't it be amazing if um, our sporting audiences started to have an expectation that we would talk about it? And wouldn't it be great if your sports fans sitting on the sofa um, was wondering how green their club was or how green their sport was and um, expecting us to ask, to ask a question so that they could be better informed. And wouldn't it be great for us as sports broadcasters to get to a point where it was actually that normal? Um, that's just what struck me. And in answer to your question, um, I am optimistic and I think... Um, I talked a lot about collaboration and I think we're all working together so well um, to make this normal um, and that is um, a great cause for optimism I think. Thank you Fergus for your contributions today and finally David Garrido. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Hazel I, I'm just looking at the chat and and you know the response to this session is 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 brilliant and I feel exactly the same and yeah, even more buoyed by it you know and and look I'm I'm only human. I'm imperfect. Everyone has a bit of, you know, ups and downs with this, you know, climate anxiety and things like that. I don't feel like this every single day, but I always kind of get back on my feet and say, but we've got to keep doing this. So I think that to David's point about being bold, absolutely. Um, you know, we've got to keep trying to sort of lead the way, you know, this won't solve itself. 
we have to try and take a leading role. And I've talked before about how sport is so special and unique. Um, and yeah, let's collab. Um, Caroline, let's have a chat. Let's see what we can do together, you know, as broadcasters, you know, is there a, almost like a presenter's union, you, me, Hazel, and we'll bring the rest on board as well, you know, and try and get more and more people involved in this. Because I do think, you know, like, like Fergus said, you know, it's not like BT and Sky are at loggerheads over, over everything. And I think that time has kind of passed. And, you know, um, I, I'd like to think we, we work very, very closely with the BBC on the uh, online hate campaign um, against online hate and hate won't win, uh, which I also sort of played a part in and sort of told my stories about, about having received that. And it was incredibly powerful. And it's even more powerful when people do genuinely collaborate and work together not just for show but actually do share stuff um and and yeah let's just absolutely keep going i'm just very much feeding on the kind of positive vibe of of, of everyone in this in in this uh in, in this session in this call and and edit and basically editorially commissioners give us the airtime producers trust us because we can really help normalize the conversation i couldn't put it better myself thank you very much indeed david um no Okay, thank you very much to my uh, running backs from their four different teams today. Uh, hopefully in our discussions around sports broadcasting and its role in response to climate change, we have carried the ball just a few yards further down the field this morning. Uh, thank you to my panelists, to Caroline, to both David G's, uh, <laughs> Garrido and Gilbert, and of course, uh, to Fergus, to you for your interest. And of course, everybody who's watching us around the world, it would appear, uh, for your interest and your attendance and indeed your contributions via the chat today. It's been a privilege to be with you and thank you very much for asking me to chair this seminar. I will hand you back to Tricia. Thank you, Hazel. Um, well, we, we, always, we always say that Hazel is probably the best in the business and I think you've just seen a perfect example of that now <laughs> and has left me just the right amount of time to do the final bits of housekeeping and wrap up on time. So, you know, brilliant, uh, brilliant presentation skills there. Um, thank you from Albert to all of our speakers as well. I think this has been the most exemplary panel. Apologies to everyone who posted questions that I didn't get a chance to answer. I think some of them were answered during the course of the, the discussion anyway, so they were sort of naturally brought up. Um, I should also say a huge thank you to our consortium, the Sports Consortium. I know that Siobhan's going to put a link into everybody that's in the Albert Sports Consortium that's brought us to this point, that we can actually have this debate that's come together to sort of sit in a darkened online room to, to, to work all of this out. So thank you to all of you. Um, and to our event partners, Sarch and Disc, um, Camera, Location One, Green Tomato Cars, and Good Energy for um, enabling us to make all of these events um, free of charge for everyone in the sector. If you'd like to learn more about what sport can be doing, we do encourage you to join the Sports Positive Summit. And Claire Poole has been mentioned in dispatches a few times today, and she is an absolute force of nature in this agenda across the whole sports um, community, not just the broadcasting and television part of it. Um, that's taking place on the 28th and 29th of September and a link to that is just about to be or has just been posted in the chat if you would like to attend that and um, the only other thing for me to say is thank you again to everybody thank you Hazel and have the rest of a wonderful day wherever you are thanks guys goodbye thanks everyone thank you Bye. latest